we're live. <laughs> we're live <laughs> from Zoom. It's Faith and Food. <laughs> Such a good intro. <laughs> Thank you. I worked on it for a while. I'm just kidding. Um, okay. Well, I don't know. Um, I think given right now that we're a smaller group, it would be fun just to to say, because Leah, I don't know if you know everyone on the screen and if everyone knows Leah. So I'll introduce just to say um, this morning, like, thanks for being here. And um, Leah is uh, joined the staff at the church about a week before COVID, I think. Mm -hmm. um, well, before we shut down for COVID, not that COVID suddenly existed because we knew about it. Um, and um, and I'll let her say more about her own story. But yeah, just um, would love if everyone could say, you know, just who you are and maybe um, how long you've been connected to the community. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. I can say a little more first. I, yeah, um, started same time with, with Andrew. Um, it was like a week before. I think we had one youth group in person. Mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and then everything shut down um so we've uh since then been on the, the wonderful journey of bringing things virtual and pivoting doing what we can outside um and trying to build those relationships with the youth over virtual has been funny um but has been working and great at the same time um so it's been it's been incredibly fun to get to know people in this community, but um, truly our our youth um, they're just incredible people, and getting to spend time with them uh, we've we've done a lot online we've done like virtual escape rooms we've done um, we've done a lot of different games where you can play on your phone but be be on Zoom together and um, and then they have small groups they do on there and meet. Um, and since since we started to, um, we've been able to recruit a lot of uh, like young adult volunteer leaders um, and they've been amazing with our students. They just like check in on them a lot, grab coffee, go for walks. Um, I'm really, really grateful for them. And it's it's been really cool to see. I feel like um, the summer we did get to go on, we went on like a three day little like camping trip and we went kayaking and everyone had their own individual tents. Like it was, it was kind of a scene to see like three campsites with like <laughs> a bunch of different individual tents. I think we had 17 students go on that trip for high school um, and it was super fun. And so they, like this summer, they were like, can we go do that again? <laughs> um, even though they were, it was COVID and it was such a, you know, interesting situation, but but yeah, it, it's been really fun at the same time to just be creative and hang out with them. They are amazing students and I think really embody um, our hope and goal of the youth community, um, which is truly to be that welcoming space, um, a place of belonging um, where you can feel secure to be yourself and safe to be yourself because that's when we're able to discover the biggest truths in ourselves and um, be put in a place for our spiritual journeys when we're, when we feel like we belong. Um, and so I think that's just been a really beautiful thing to see them own that and um, kind of come to life. So yeah, little, little tangent about our youth, but they're wonderful. So. That got multiple hearts. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Right, well, feel free anyone who wants to just jump in. Um, I'm Paige. I, um, Leah and I know each other. I've been part of the community since I was a child. Um, and my husband and I became members in around Thanksgiving of 2019. Um, and I've been enjoying uh, the events with the young adults and emerging adults like the escape room. That was really fun. And um, I also am part of the adult ed ministry action team. Um, and I just enjoy participating in the food events and also the faith and justice and humanities events. Um, I've been really appreciative of all the digital online programming that's been going on. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thanks, Paige. 
Well, since Paige went, I'll go next because I'm Paige's mom. Uh, I'm, <laughs> as Daniel referred to me on the food call two Saturdays ago, he said, it's not a bad thing to be Paige's mom. He said. <laughs> So I'm, I'm Cynthia Latham and we, and my husband and I have been attending Colonial probably for about 35 or 36 years, not sure of the exact length of time. Um, and we just became members two years ago, partly because with all the switches between ministers, we're kind of waiting for some stability in that regard. And then, you know, not long after that, Daniel wasn't the minister anymore. I mean, that was one of the reasons we decided, oh, this is a minister that we we can live with and we really like. And then of course we know mm -hmm. what happened. Um, so um, we were happy to see that Paige and Rick became members a year after us. So now we're family and colonial. Um, we appreciate Zoom that's for sure because even with Zoom, I think we feel still even a little disconnected. So I'm really looking forward to the day when we're back in the pews, hopefully. Mm -hmm in the near future. And I'm retired, by the way, I've been retired for a couple of years, which is nice, but it seems like I get less done in retirement than when I was working. <laughs> awesome. Sounds like it's supposed to go that way, though. You're retired. I'll go. I'm Sarah. And I, as of the 21st um, of this month, um, have been at the church for three years. Woo! I'm Michelle. I am Prime, and I've been at the church oh, a little over 35 years and met Mike there. We've been married almost 26 oh. years. Um, involved in choir almost the whole time. Mm. And uh, I'm really enjoying, I love to cook and bake, so I'm really enjoying these Saturday sessions on Zoom. That's great. Michelle, did you want to go? Sure. Barb, I didn't know you guys met at church. That's I cool. didn't either. That's cute. Yeah. Yay. Um, yeah, I'm <laughs> Michelle, and I grew up at the church. If you know um, Elgin and Sally Manor, they're my parents. And um, left for a little bit in my 20s when I was living in Colorado and then I met Lance out there and we moved back here and we've been here ever since. And for Debbie and Andrea, um, we had just been going around and doing, um, uh, and I think the Pinskys are more just kind of listening. So the Pinskys have been around for a while. They're lovely humans and uh, mm -hmm. Dave and Kathy. And um, they also raised their daughter at the church. So Andre Andrea and uh, Debbie, we were just going around and saying our names and how long we've been connected to the community um, since Leah started at the church a week before COVID. <laughs> um, my name's Andrea Rossman, and I've been at the church since they built the church there. <laughs> so that's a long time. I didn't know that. That's cool, Andrea. I walked, I walked there from the old, from the old church from Wooddale Avenue. That's, awesome. That's cool. Thanks for being here. Debbie, that leaves you. Uh, I'm Debbie Treese. I've been at the church for a decade or so. Um, mm. What else am I supposed to say? That's, that's it. I mean, you could say whatever you want. <laughs> I said, you could say whatever. That was all I had asked was yeah, for sure just well, to say hi and the, pro the problem is I rolled out of bed about two minutes ago so <laughs> I'm not awake yet my husband welcome me, the alarm clock had been ringing for an hour <laughs> he didn't know why so he didn't wake me up <laughs> well, that's well, well, honor, right? and um I guarantee you that these scones would, are going to be something that you're, you're going to want to get out of bed for when you make them um, okay. So we uh, yeah, yes. bring us bring us in to the scone world this morning. The scone world, um, a little bit about my my baking world. What I grew to love baking. Um, it's been a lot of um, tradition of of baking being passed down. Um, but my grandma was um, she doesn't bake anymore, but she um, was an excellent baker when she did and um 
baked all kinds of cakes and pies and bars. Um, she'd be the one that like her recipe, you know, got put in the little um, church cookbook. Um, <laughs> that's small town Iowa. Um, and just, it, I always like thought it was fun to kind of tag along in the kitchen and watch what she was doing. Um, and then my mom also was a great baker. Um, so growing up, she just would always be, you know, baking cookies or cakes or whatever, um, type of deal. And I, and I loved, like, my mom was like the mom when friends were over, like they knew she had like cookies in the freezer. Um, and so that was just really fun. Like she always had, she always had something on hand to give to people, um, which was great. Cause she just really, I feel like embodied a lot of hospitality, like, um, more than I realized, of course, when I was like a angsty teenager, but, um, so yeah, baking has just always been kind of a fun thing. We're like, um, pretty heavy Norwegian heritage. So, um, Christmas, we like, we make all of our own handmade lefse and, um, a bunch of different Norwegian treats too. Um, so I just started getting to learn more of that stuff, but, um, kind of what I like about baking too, is that like, there's that tradition side, but then, um, there's space for it to become your own thing, um, to venture off into like what you want to learn how to bake, what you want to learn how to do. Um, and that kind of like scones are not a tradition thing in our family. Um, so this became something like, I felt like every time I would go and have like a scone at a coffee shop or something, I was like, it's dry. It's never quite that good. Like, why are they never quite that good? Like I want it to be great. And so I started just like, yeah, experimenting with baking scones and adapting and coming up. And then um, my mom always liked these like savory scones she had at a coffee shop one time. And so I switched from kind of like the berry and sweet to figuring out like different savory combinations and working with that, which is, um, I think like a big hit because people are like, usually it's a sweet treat and this is like, it just is different. And um, yeah, really good flavors. I think it, I think equally as good to have in the morning with breakfast or whenever, but um, yeah. So baking, I think that's partially why I've loved it. And um, for me too, it's a space that my brain kind of shuts off from everything else. Um, baking, you kind of, you have to pay attention to what you're doing. You can't just like throw stuff together, like cooking, like it matters how we put our ingredients together. Right. And how we're, um, how much we're putting it to, you know, very specific, there's a science to it. So to me, it just gives me like space to slow down and focus on what I'm doing and, and be present. Not like, otherwise I, I, you know, I'm a pretty like go getter, busy body do person. Um, so this has always been a good space for me to just kind of say like, Oh, take a deep breath, bake something and take your time because you don't want to mess it up, you know? And, um, just learn, learn the art of it. So scones have been something that have been fun because like they, I think when you look at a recipe, it's kind of like, oh, it seems pretty easy and basic to put together, which is generally like pretty true. Um, but I've learned, you know, the little tricks and things that I like that give it, like, I can know how it smells, how it tastes, how it feels, um, for it to, to, to know that it's like actually going to be a good scones. Um, so yeah, that's like a little bit about baking and scones more than you want. So I'm going to start with, um, I just have a big bowl here, big mixing bowl. Um, I'm going to start with just putting all of the dry ingredients together, which is um, most of the ingredients in this recipe. Um, just so as a note, we, oh yeah. I, and for everybody, I did put the... Um, link for the recipe. I just remembered I hadn't done that. I put it in the Perfect. chat. Perfect. So yeah, follow along on that. Um, so I'm going to start with my flour, which people, if you're really technical about baking, get really technical about their flour. Uh, this is the freshest I have right now is Bob's Red Mill, uh, all purpose flour, organic, but there's like Bakersfield and a couple different ones around here that you can buy like that's really fresh and people say that makes a lot of difference like your flour and your butter as fresh as you can get it is what makes 
baked goods even better. Um, I don't know the reason to this, but this is one thing that's tradition. My grandma always says, don't scoop your measure cup. You spoon your flour into your measuring cup to get the most accurate measure of your flour. I love that and we're getting so much goodness of your grandma in today. Yeah, she's a great lady. Yeah. So I, I don't know if that's true or not, but obviously then uh, you're gonna wanna level off your flour. And one cup. sometimes when you scoop it it like I've noticed that it could like hit a like it doesn't fully fill in the bottom sometimes or something I don't know could just be making that up but we got that in there and I like don't have this memorized off the top of my head that's like part of the fun of baking for me is like not going to memorize it it's just it's written down and I'm following it <laughs> uh so we got our flour in there we're gonna do just a teaspoon of sugar just a little bit in there and then um we're gonna do a tablespoon of baking powder and if you're trying to learn more about baking too in general if your baking powder isn't fresh it's really not good um it gets clumpy and, and lumped together, which a lot of times is why people sift things too. Um, but if it's clumpy together, like I don't know if you guys have ever had something that is baked good and you bite into it and there's like a bitterness, like in just one little area, um, that's baking powder. That's bad baking powder clumped together. So try to keep your baking powder as fresh as possible. Like if, if it's expired or if it's lumpy, it's not get some new stuff um we're gonna do a teaspoon of garlic powder i'm just throwing these all in the bowl and we'll mix them together so and then just a uh, half a teaspoon of salt i do my salt by hand a lot i don't know why <laughs> I feel like I can I feel like I get an accurate measure of it um, so those are our dry ingredients that we're gonna go ahead and just mix together in your bowl I kind of just love because I mean and you said this Leah um, and some of you know this but like um, like Leah is absolutely like she's uh, a like achiever like get things done you know, very self-possessed and, and just like one of the things we were talking about is like with the spirituality of food of like, what a, like um, what a spiritual practice it is for you to do this too. Mm -hmm. And that to really, to take that space or I'm going to actually follow directions. I'm going <laughs> to turn off my brain. I'm not going to force myself. To, like, I'm not going to memorize a thing. It's a point. It's a space where you literally just like immerse yourself then in the recipe. Yeah. It's, that's just what it is. Some people do that with like, you know, Netflix shows or whatever. And I do that with Netflix shows sometimes too. Um, but yeah, I think, and I like, I like don't know why, but one of my favorite um, like times to bake is if it's raining outside, like, and I love musicals. So like Les Mis, I'll just put on the Les Mis soundtrack and then it's raining outside and I'm baking something. It's like the most like, holy place for me to be which is just mm. like a funny thing but I'm like well I can't go do anything outside like I can't go exercise because it's raining like it, it like eliminates that like uh I gotta go do something off of me mm. and then just like yeah having it feels like cozy inside and you got your warm oven on and you're just you're like there's not there's nothing else to do I'm just gonna be slow and bake and I just find that really fun mm. um so Leah, your recipe calls out sea salt specifically. Is there a reason why you prefer sea salt? You know, I do. I like more, um, I feel like sea salt has a little bit of a better, truer, like truer flavor. Um, 
I like kind of like a bigger salt grain too. So like a lot of times you can, you know, choose like the setting of what you grind your sea salt to, or um, yeah, like it just comes that way usually in bigger, like I feel, yeah. So for what, I don't know if that's like, you know, really true or not, but I actually um, like love this uh, kosher salt a lot. Yeah, I um, yeah, so that's like my favorite thing to use in baking a lot of times. Um, so the next step, we have all of our, our dry ingredients mixed together in this bowl. Um, and this is like the fun part about baking scones because next we're gonna cut in our butter and we don't want really soft butter. Like the to make a good scone, you have to like cut in cold butter. That's the same with like pie crust too. Um, sometimes like if our, if you know, or cookies, like uh, if we put melted butter in, then a lot of times you need to chill your dough before you bake it because otherwise we're gonna have this like really flat result. Like when we see things that come out flat cookies, like it's usually because your butter was melted or too soft. Um, and so scones are one of those things that really wants, they really want you to have cold cold butter that you cut into it. So I, I really don't put it out of the fridge like too long before I'm gonna make scones. Like it's pretty cold. Um, and I kind of cut it into a little bit smaller squares um, before I throw it into the our, our dry mix here. But so mine's just, it's just kind of like in half and in half again. Um, and this part, if you have a, a pastry blender, does anyone know what, what, what those are? Yeah, isn't Debbie? it like, it's like the handle is like a bench scraper, but then it has like a, almost to like a round kind of potato masher thing on the bottom. Yeah, a lot of times people confuse them as like, oh, it's to like mash potatoes. Um, yeah. But it looks, looks like this, and this is pretty like sharp, like it's not, it's not really dull. I mean, it's, it's not going to cut you, but it's, yeah. <laughs> and so this is a this is a pastry blender, and this is uh, what you would use to like cut in your butter. If you mm. don't have one of these, however, like I think one of the fun parts too about about cutting in your butter is just using your hands. So you can totally just dig in with your hands. That's like one of the sensory things that's fun too, um, to just mm. like feel your dough. Um, and you don't want to overwork this part. Like a lot of times people are like, I really got to make sure the butter is like really mixed in and I say like get it to like where it's about like pea size um that your butter like looks like that and so with my pastry blender I'll, I just kind of press in and twist like and it'll start to like clump up on on your pastry blender and you kind of keep going and it pushes all the way through um and yeah I think this like we don't have to like freak out about it being like really, really well mixed in here. Um, a lot of times we think like, oh, I gotta make sure this is like cut in. And so you do from time to time have to kind of clear off your pastry blender. I just thought that was like a really not intelligently shaped potato masher. Oh no. <laughs> when I was growing up, like I, 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 I just learned something new. I didn't know that that's Very what those were <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yep, I'm, and I'm suddenly thinking, oh, that would make my pie making way easier. Yes, this, that's exactly what it's for. All the tools they come up with. Like, I don't know if people are familiar with like Pampered Chef, but I feel like I like going on there like once every couple months, just be like, okay, what do you have now? Because all of their like cooking and baking stuff, like you're like, whoa, makes your life so much easier. Um, so this is, I don't know if we can really see this. This is kind of what the dough looks like after. Um, so like, here's one chunk of butter, not exactly pea size, but like this one is. So I'm fine with that, it's great. Um, so we're gonna set that aside for just a little bit. Um, and then our, we're gonna get our other ingredients ready to mix with that, which is gonna be our wet stuff, which 
is not not a lot for this particular recipe. Um, this is the really fun part where we get to get our, I'm gonna get a smaller bowl quick. I remember feeling so cool when I like learned how to separate the egg yolk from the egg white. Like I was like, when I can do this now with like my own two hands and like, I don't need a tool or anything. Like <laughs> I, I'm now like I've arrived in baking, right? Like <laughs> this is great. So yep. your, your egg white, getting that out of there. We're going to use the, the yolk to mix in with our heavy whipping cream. Um, so I just saved the egg white because we're actually going to use that once we're done to put on top of our scones before we bake them. Um, so crack, you crack your egg, right? Now it's in half and I'm just going back and forth until that egg white has dripped out. And now I just have the yolk in there and I'm putting that into my other small dish. Like that's a very, it's a very fun thing when we get to separate our, our white and our yellow. <laughs> yep. um, so you can set aside your egg white and then our egg yolk is ready to, we're gonna put a, a cup of heavy whipping cream in with that. So also this recipe, like anyone that's like, can't eat dairy, that's, this is a no-go for them. It's really sad. I haven't tried making these dairy-free. I have tried, I have made them gluten-free. And like, um, I like experimenting a lot, baking like gluten and dairy-free um, and like using just like natural sweeteners like honey or maple syrup. Um, and so I have found in that like oat flour is really, really excellent when it comes to baking. Um, that's been my favorite. Like it seems to hold um, and be as true to like, like normal regular flour would be. Um, so I, yeah, I like oat flour a lot for, for that. And then there are other like gluten-free people that to do. Uh, oat milk is thick enough, Michelle. Um, that is actually what I'm using right now because I don't have heavy whipping cream. So this is my favorite brand of oat milk because they have different like fat levels, which is kind of like the thickness. Um, so this is like a full fat one. What's that is called? also excellent. Uh, it's called Oatly. Oatly. It's also really great in your coffee. If okay. you are like, you like cream and stuff in your coffee. Um, so yeah, that, that's great. So I guess the only thing with that would be um, you can use oat milk and we have cheese in this. So that's the only thing I haven't really tried is doing like a dairy free cheese in this. I don't know <coughs> how, how it like bakes as well. So, so I got my egg yolk in the oat milk there and I'm bringing my dry ingredients back in. Um, I actually, so the, I still, when I started making these, I did like fresh chives and like, like ham, like thinly sliced ham. Um, you can be super simple with that ham. Like I've bought in like thinly sliced honey ham, like from the deli or like prepackaged, like that's like, just chop that up and it works really well. Um, also if you have, if you use dried chives like if that's what you have that's totally fine too um but anything a little fresher is just going to taste a little bit better but it's still going to taste good if it's dried too um and then I started kind of venturing into like making different combinations and this has been my favorite one lately is bacon and rosemary um especially with coffee I just like noticed after eating it like the like I take a drink of coffee and the rosemary would like come to life in your mouth even more from the coffee. Um, it sounds so, amazing. Yeah, it's super fun to like experiment with those different flavors too. I was thinking today, I was like, you could do like a turkey sausage type deal and do like sage with that too. Um, 
really like these ingredients are really interchangeable. So um, I have some rosemary in this little dish here that I've just peeled off and I'm going to chop it up a little bit. This is like something I like to do personally to chop up any type of fresh herb is take a pair of scissors and then like cut in just in the bowl. Seems to like be more efficient than trying to chop it on a cutting board to me, I guess. Um, so I'm not going to go like super small with this, but just get it a little more broken up for sure. And it smells, it smells so good right now as I'm chopping this. Oh my gosh. Rosemary. So good. So I'm going to go ahead and put that straight in my dry ingredients. <clears throat> and then I have bacon I pre-cooked already too. So this is like fully cooked bacon. Um, I just got an air fryer recently and I cooked my bacon in there. Like if you guys haven't gotten an air fryer or heard about that, might be something worth checking out if you like cooking because it's made fun new adventures. You can bake in it too, but I have not done that yet. Um, so I'm gonna put like roughly a half cup of bacon in here, maybe a little more because it's bacon. Who doesn't love that? Um, so this is going straight into our dry ingredients here. And then we're gonna also put in our cup of cheddar, cheese. My dad right now would be like, why aren't you freshly grating your cheese? But say, cause I don't want to dad. He like I loves freshly grated cheese. cheese. Is one of the worst kitchen tasks ever. Like I, I always grate my fingers, I get it everywhere. I'm not Every a convenient time. package person, but like shredded cheese is totally worth it in my opinion. Yeah, so like, I agree with you on that page. I oh. think like, but it's like if my dad's around and I'm like making something, he's like, no, I'll shred it, I'll shred it. Like he's like very like <laughs> insistent upon shredding cheese freshly, which I get like it is probably better, but you know. And the reason, the reason, um, cause you, I mean, your family, so your, your family, your grandma's family, who's been very influential, like have had a farm in Iowa. Right. And so, yes. um, I got, I got roomed out by my best friend's, um, dad when I was in high school, but he was involved in, um, global commodity trading, um, around beef and, and beef products. And he said, he said the reason why he refused to let us do shredded cheese was that um, for most major brands, I don't think some of the smaller organic farms, this would be true. It's, there, it's different regulations and standards for shredded cheese versus um, blocks or whatever. You know? and so, yeah. <laughs> says the person who knows nothing about how her food comes <laughs> to her. But, um, and so, so he was like, that's why he was always pushing us that you should shred it. And so now I just buy organic, like, like small batch shredded cheese in my thing most of the time and then, and then I apologize to my my best friend's dad in my head every time yes I I try to buy like organic as much as possible or as my budget allows me because I think that is true for many many things we purchase like it's if you're if it's organic or like I'm part of a food co-op and I like to go buy things there um again, as much as I can afford, but as much as we can buy organic or locally, it's like going to be fresher ingredients. It's going to be a better, like, you know, that those people have been like, I don't know, treating their animals or ingredients better or like that type of thing too. And so um, I read it in a book somewhere. I don't remember which book, but it was like, would you rather, you know, pay the big pharma or would you rather pay the farmer? So like kind of, you know, what we put in our bodies now too is like important um, for what we, otherwise we might be just spending that money down the road um, paying for the necessary drugs and things too. So, um, which we might still have to anyways, you know, but that's life. So, so I'm mixing all of, all of this in here. Um, Michelle, my air fryer brand is Gorm Gourmia. Uh, it was on sale at Target for like fifty dollars. 
so it's great it has like it has a bacon button it has like a fries button um it's it's pretty fun to experiment with so i'm just mixing those things into here again this rosemary smells so good um and then what we're gonna do is you're gonna create kind of like a center in your dry ingredients we're gonna form form a well as they call it in baking so there's kind of like a little hole in the middle um which is where we're going to pour in our egg yolk and cream. Just pour that straight into the center that, that you just made. I can show you guys that. So it's just in the middle there. And when we talk about folding in ingredients, um, I don't know if any of you are Schitt's Creek, fans there's a Bold very funny cheese, Leah <laughs> I don't know how to fold tiny broken cheese like that uh folding in our ingredients means kind of this like we're starting it here in the middle and now I'm gonna push my my dry ingredients from the side over top of it and then you can really start to mix it around in there mm. And again, this is like something we don't need to get super worried about, like making sure it's super well mixed because we are gonna, you know, use our hands and knead it together and knead it out a little bit. And if you like, so if you have some like flour that's still um, kind of on the bottom of your bowl and stuff that hasn't mixed in, that's okay. We're just gonna like use that to still dump out and knead in with the dough. Um, so here's kind of what mine looks like right now. And I am nothing fancy when I go to knead out dough or anything like that. I just use my countertop always. I mean, I make sure it's clean usually, but put a little flour down there not a, this usually doesn't need a lot of a ton of extra flour um actually sometimes i feel like the dough could be a little more dry in which case if it's not really coming together super well um you can just add a little more heavy cream and mix that together always start with like less than what you think you might need to add and that way you can add more um or if it gets too wet again you can add some more flour. Um, I can try to angle my computer down. No? I don't know if we can see that. A little bit, can we see this okay? Um, so I kind of have a big ball here now and this is actually like fairly sticky. Might be the oat milk. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and just press it down. We're gonna do it into like a big disc, big circle. Actually, I'm gonna get a little more flour in this. That's better. It's funny watching you do this. I can like picture you on your family's farm in, in Iowa, like kneading the dough, hanging out with grandma. Hanging out, grandma. Yeah, it's a, uh, this has become like anytime. So my, my grandma's side of the family is fairly big. Like I have a bunch of cousins and we, um, that's my, that's my mom's side of the family. And we, like have always just had giant family get togethers. Like my cousins feel like siblings to me, which is really sweet um, and not, you know, kind of unique, I guess. But um, we do like our Christmas together is like four days of just like games and food and hanging out. 
Um, so any like and we have a cabin family cabin up in northern Minnesota and that's like growing up my parents my mom's a school nurse my dad was a teacher and then like most of my aunts and uncles are like teachers or work in the school system as well and so we like everyone would have their summers off and we would just go up to the cabin and so our parents call it camp cousin because they were like you guys literally just (laughs) swam and played and we made food for you and like and I was like yeah is that what everyone did like as a kid in the summer you know like um but definitely was not the case for everyone (laughs) obviously not everyone has their parents off all summer but it was so fun and so like that's something we still love to get up to do in the summer too and just hang out at the the cabin Um, but we love hanging out at the farm and just making good food and hanging out together there too but um, yeah that's this has become like one of the things that's like okay which morning is like Leah making scones Um, and then a bigger thing like a a newer tradition that's happened out of my love for baking has been um at the cabin we have to do like we do pizzas on the grill um and I make the pie or I make the pizza crust and that's super fun to make too and delicious like just crispy good crackery crust on the grill so that's really fun if you guys ever want to try that that's pretty easy okay so I have that's awesome. So I, I know we're almost at the next step. I just, I'm going to interject yeah. for a minute. Cause our, our, um, our person who in our community is going to share oh, yes. a little bit about, you know, cause part of faith and food has been wanting to, you know, both during COVID and January have a space for all of us, you know, just to be able to be together and do something fun on a Saturday morning, but then also just deepening that connection between our faith and spirituality and food and service and eating and all the things. And so I just, uh, Stacy Rogers is with us this morning. I don't know if y'all know Stacy. Stacy is one of our deacons. Hi, Stacy. Hi. And Stacy. Um, Stacy is also my prayer partner this year because each of the staff people have been assigned a person from. Um, or vice versa, actually, you got to sign me. Um, So would you just share a little bit about your involvement with CS just for a couple minutes for folks who might not know about it? Yeah. For some of you, you're going to really know about CES if you've come to all three of these. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Oh, and by the way, the Oatly milk, we get the Oatly ice cream at Target and it's amazing. So you guys should try it if you're trying to go dairy-free. Just a tip. <laughs> but yeah, CES, so I met with them. I think I first got together with CES over 10 years ago. So I worked at Medica for 18 years. And I've always worked with this program called MSHOW, which is Minnesota Senior Health Options. So it's a program for people who are 65 and over who have medical assistance in Medicare. So it's a you know no cost plan that's, um, that gives people awesome health Didn't I think Stacy froze. Out of the way. Yeah, I think so. The seniors. And there we have a lot of um, East African people on our program as well. And so I, I think that's what probably regarding that population and the contacts I have. And then just got involved with helping with their food shelf. So they have a food shelf in the basement of their church. Um, and they get a lot of Somali uh, people, Latino and um, just, you know, American, African-American and um, people from that community in South, South Minneapolis, close to downtown. And uh, they just do awesome work. They have a, their Meals on Wheels program. They actually have an East African Meals on Wheels program, which is pretty unique. Um, so I created a, a team at Medica that drove for that. Um, so we did one day a week driving for the Meals on Wheels. I think that is still in active. I'm no longer at Medica, now I'm at Blue Cross. So, um, so that's changed, but, and also Medica, I connected them because I was a volunteer on their foundation and I connected them with a foundation that's helped finance, you know, giving them some donations to do some good work and bringing like canvas bags for them to stack their, to stack their food. Um, so people can reuse those bags and bring them back in. So they just do, they do amazing work in the community and they also have a, a animal program for Meals on Wheels. 
they don't like, you know, cat dog food to low income families that have pets, which I think is also really unique and cool. Um, so they do a great service in the community. Um, and the people that are working in that building, they're so caring and loving. They have advocates that are on staff. So people can come in and meet with an advocate and talk about their financial issues and get some directions and resources in the community. So we just do, do so much. Um, and it must have been five or six years ago, my mother-in-law is an artist and she actually painted some murals in the church for them. And I think a couple of them are still there. One of them, they had to cover up because they did some remodeling in the basement, but she painted like a tree and really beautiful murals in their church. Um, so I just, I'd still volunteer. On, um, and they, I think they always need help. They're always looking for volunteers. So they're, they're close to my heart. I really love that organization. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing about that a little bit. And um, Leah, we're gonna turn it back to you because I know um, we have some stuff to get in the oven. We do, we're really close. So here's our Thanks, dish. Thanks guys. It's pressed to about like uh, half quarter inch thickness. Um, and so we got, we got that ready. We're gonna go ahead and take our egg white that we had from before. And this is like, people like to brush this and do that type of thing. This is a sensory thing for me that I love and feel like you can really like know that it's well covered. I just like to use my hands and take the egg white and like put it straight on there and kind of rub it all around the top and kind of get some on the edges. And I just feel like you can really feel where this is like covering and filling in better than brushing it. So personal, personal preference, if this grosses you out, you don't have to do it this way, <laughs> but I enjoy that. So we're just gonna make sure it's well covered and our egg white is, I feel like it, uh, you know, it almost acts as like a protectant, like for the baking, um, it keeps the top from, you know, baking as quite as fast and gives us a nice golden brown top um, and really kind of seals in the moisture. So to me, this is like a big thing when we talk about scones being dry, like we can't forget our egg white on top because it's sealing in a lot of that good buttery cream moisture into our scone. Um, so we got our disc and then I simply do cut it like a pizza. Like I take my pizza cutter and do it into eight pieces. Boom, we got that. And now we're ready to get them onto our pan. This is a silicone baking mat. Um, I have, a lot of people like to use these because it is easier cleanup, but um, I think with this, it's recommended with scones. Like, I don't know, I feel like they, they bake a little bit differently um, straight on the pan. Like you might just wanna have it a little bit further up from center of the oven. Um, just so the bottom doesn't get as like crispy fast before it's like baking. But I feel like this kind of helps with that a little bit too. Um, I don't really know if that's true, but that's been my experimentation. So I'm just gonna get one out here. We're gonna put them on the pan. No no real rhyme or reason to this, just however you fit them on there. Um, I forgot what I was just gonna say. So we got them on there and I do not have them pre-baked in the oven, like a magical cooking show where they just pull them out already, so. Um, <laughs> that's always like my favorite thing when they're they're like, and here they are, like <laughs> already done. But I do have my oven at 425. Um, 
And these do not take that long. I'd say 12 to 15 minutes, depending on kind of what your oven is. This is like probably the most basic of ovens out there. So um, <laughs> it's not convection oven or anything like that. Um, and <laughs> I, wish I, just more to, I wish more baking in other shows were like in like, like normal human kitchens, <laughs> you know, right? Like, this is my rental and the oven doesn't really work, but <laughs> here's how I make it work anyway. <laughs> seriously that's like half the stuff in our house so um yeah these are these are in there about like they're middle of the oven um so with that I'm like the rack isn't the middle of the oven the baked goods are at the middle of the oven so sometimes we you know think about that like if our rack is in the middle of the oven the baked goods are actually higher than that so um kind of yeah just a little teeny note um so I'm gonna put these in for like 12 13 minutes and then check them from there see how they look I think the best judgment on scones is um seeing if they're done like obviously there's some golden brown on top um but really like the bottom is a good indicator if the bottom is like golden brown like if you can get a spatula and kind of peek at it um that to me says like the scone is done um and I think that the top naturally then has that too but um yeah if there's golden brown on the on the bottom um that's usually a good indicator and sometimes it might feel like um like there's no like toothpick test on scones really so like it might seem like it's like not quite done but really trust that like golden brown on top and bottom um, because anytime we are having hot baked goods coming out of our oven like they're going to continue to bake right we're not on the British Bake Off where I have like a chiller I'm going to go run and put it into um, so just noting that like anytime we're baking something and we don't have our our chill blaster um, things are going to continue to bake a little bit um, and kind of you know take that set so that's just a note for that too and a lot of times why I think we over bake things like is because of that we think oh it's like it's not done it doesn't seem done like the consistency but we all know a cookie is like falling apart when it first comes out of the oven right we can't just like take it off the pan and it kind of finishes baking and cooling um so we give it a few more minutes so that I would say is true with mostly any baked good. So yeah, Sarah, do you wanna hop in and do I your do. spiel or do we have any questions before I, that or? I, that, that's exactly what I was gonna say is like any questions or things or, or observations or things from your own experience of, of baking that you yeah. wanna jump in right now. Um, I have a question, it's Kathy and I have been always wanting to make scones. I love scones, I love savory scones, but we also have someone in our household who really can't eat <laughs> gluten and she can't yeah. eat dairy. So I was intrigued about how you talked about the oat flour and then you said the oatly milk. And mm -hmm. I did find a vegan butter, sorry, I can't remember the name of it. I just know what it looks like. Oh and yeah, it yep. does well with baking. So. It yes. sounds like the only challenge that we would have is maybe with the whipping cream or is that what you would yeah, so, use um, oatly milk instead? Yeah, that's when I would use the oatly milk instead in place of the whipping cream. Um, I think I've used a, a vegan butter too for a lot of baking. Um, Earth Balance is like a, a brand that makes it. Um, that's that, it. Yeah, yeah, it's super good. Like I have seen no difference using that butter versus real butter. Um, and um, yeah, I would say the other, the challenge would be your, like your cheese, just finding like, I, I just personally haven't tried that yet. Um, it probably would be just fine. Like, I don't know, like how it would bake, I guess. Um, but I think honestly, you could just leave the cheese out. Like the, the flavors that I feel like are most, um, yeah, delicious in scones are like your fresh, like like the rosemary and the bacon or the chives and like the ham, like that type of thing. 
um obviously like you know the cheese is like a nice thing but um I some people who are dairy sensitive um I don't know if it's intolerant or sensitive but um can still handle like goat cheese too and there is like a black goat cheese you can get that I've gotten at Trader Joe's that is really um delicious and that like acts like a, that really feels like normal cheese to me um so that might be something to play around with too but I believe these would be like good without the, the cheese in them also so thank you yeah and yeah. I'd say that's one of the things I really I've always, and by always, I mean like the last year since I've known Leah, um, <laughs> appreciated about you is that, um, is that sense of that, how do you make the table um, as welcoming and as much of a space where everyone can actually be able to eat? And, and you know, it's just like with anything new, it, it can take some time to figure out like what those rhythms look like. Um, like Leah's always asking, like, does anyone have any, um, you know, food allergies or, you know, intol like intolerances? Or I think I came over and did a coffee with you the first time. And that was like some of your questions you asked me. You're like, hey, do you have any food allergies or anything I should be aware of? <laughs> and I was like, I was like, no, I, I, I think I might have jokingly said a couple of things that I just don't like, you know, but that I was yeah. quite sure you wouldn't give me over breakfast. But um, just even that sense of, of making the table a space where, you know, everyone can have food that actually is not you know isn't harmful to their bodies and um mm -hmm. it takes a little work sometimes if you're not used to it but so I appreciate you you know sharing here's some modifications you can make for folks yeah, yeah and I quickly to the um some people who uh, sorry can you guys hear me my headphones just died you can still hear me okay just a little quieter okay I'll move closer um, sometimes the people, people can't have eggs either and flax, you can actually use flaxseed placement for egg. Like it does the same bonding that an egg would do. Um, so you can, yeah, I forget the, what the ratio is, but, um, I think a lot of flaxseed either say that, or, um, you can look it up online too, but, um, that's an option as a, as an egg replacement if needed. Yeah, I just learned about a product too that is um, made from garbanzo beans that replaces egg white. It's called aguafaba and it's been gaining a bunch of popularity lately, even in like drinks to replace egg white. Um, so that could be something to look for. I've never personally used it, but I know a lot of people who have. Yeah. Yeah, other questions or your own observations from those of you who are also like, who else is like a avid baker? You got, we got a, yeah, a handful. Yeah. <laughs> this is like a, a dabble in it. Is that what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I've gotten into uh, sourdough. Ooh, and if you're yeah. gluten intolerant, sourdough is much easier on the gut. Mm -hmm. And you can almost convert any recipe you know, with sourdough. Yes, sourdough is excellent. That's awesome. Yeah, other questions or things for Leah right now or your own just, yeah, Kathy, you're doing, you're doing the on mute reach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, got me caught. So I was curious, Marilyn, about the sourdough. So you use actually, um, you've, you, you made sourdough scones? Yeah. That's awesome. I've not ventured into the sourdough world yet, but it does sound very intriguing. My mom is actually just starting that. She just like got a starter of sourdough, so. You have to plan ahead because yeah. it's usually a couple day process, but it's, the food is wonderful. The baked goods are wonderful. Mm -hmm. Leah, I have a friend that does sourdough and she makes pizza like that's oh, yeah. what she uses as her pizza crust and they'd make it on the stove, you know, like, and then put it in the oven. So with your yeah. pizza crust, maybe that's your first foray. 
That's I've like even done pie good. crust with sourdough. Yeah. You don't taste it so much with the pizza on it, like with the toppings, but then you get the crust and it's, you know, like a good piece of sourdough. It's yummy. Yeah, that sounds really good. That's really cool. I think um, one of the things with, um, you know, making that connection between thinking about, you know, spirituality and food, one of the things that really strikes me about your story, Leah, and that I wanted to ask us about is just that sense of, you know, I think you see this, you see this particularly in the Hebrew Bible and in the story of the people of Israel, the way that, you know, all of their festivals are tied to, tied to food and tied to the seasons and tied and they're generational. And um, just that sense of like, you know, sometimes we have these spiritual practices that we think of as spiritual, which are spiritual practices, but it's, you know, prayer, meditation, fasting, um, reading scripture, these sorts of things. And um, even as we're coming to Lent, one of the things we've been talking about is what are those, those other spiritual practices that are deeply spiritual, but haven't necessarily been written about in all of the you know, kind of spiritual tomes on, on here are the Christian practices. And so I think your story to me illustrates that one of the traditions we have in our faith is around the spirituality of food and the spiritual practice, you know, like I hear you talk about baking, Leah. And for me, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is one of Leah's deep spiritual practices because it is one of the spaces in your life that you really turn off your brain and you you really submit yourself to this process of the baking and allowing yourself to move into that and then the way to it's like this generational thing like you're carrying forward your grandma and her spirit and her story and so I think one of the things I was just wondering about with that is um you know if anyone has like you know thinking about your own first experience of baking like any story you'd want to share about who taught you to bake like what's kind of some of the story or the people you carry with you as you, um, as you bake and when you bake? I mean, I grew up in a large family and every Saturday, my mom baked tons of bread, both, you know, rye bread, cinnamon rolls, you name it, she baked. So my learning was from her. So when you, when you bake, like, you know, what's that like for you then? Like, do you, do you feel a sense at times of carrying that forward? Do you feel her presence ever? Like what's kind of for you in your own baking then? I do. And it's very relaxing. I love to do it like Sunday afternoons when the football game is on, especially if it's a tense game. (laughs) It relaxes me. I go to the kitchen and I bake. That's really beautiful. I love that. I remember my grandma making cinnamon rolls, how you roll it up in the, you know, put the raisins and the cinnamon and the butter and roll up the dough. And she made kolaches where you have dough and you put the prune in the middle for kolaches and she'd make bread. But we lived on a farm and she had a lot of hired help to cook for too. So I remember my grandma being a great baker. I can remember the look of her hands actually when she's making bread and her apron on and her hair braided and it's a nice vision. And Paige is is named for her. Oh, really? I don't have that same experience though because my grandmother um, got pretty ill when I was young and she now is mentally ill and so I kind of, that's a loss for me. I don't really feel like that was passed on to me. Although I did learn a lot from my parents baking. Actually, I loved watching my dad and my mom make pancakes growing up, which I realized isn't exactly baking, but I I do always wonder what it would have been like to learn some of those recipes from um, my older family members, but it just wasn't in the cards for me. Thanks so much. Thanks for sharing that too. And the way that there's both the beauty and also the grief of, of what both gets carried forward and then also the losses that we don't get, you know, get to experience. Thanks. My great grandmother lived with us for a little while, um, which was really special. Uh, and she would make homemade noodles. Um, so there were this, these really thick, really good noodles. Um, 
and then she also made like chocolate chip cookies and stuff, but she didn't ever use a recipe and never wrote anything down. And so that was one of our laments when she died that nobody had that to, to pass along. And I don't know if any of us would have been able to do it anyway, partly because she did it from memory. I don't know if she could have even really written it down, um, but it's kind of, it makes me um, think of during Thanksgiving and Christmas because of COVID, I read a headline that said, all the secret recipes are starting, starting to suddenly be shared because you can't gather. And so grandmas are like, okay, you can have the recipe, you know, and um, but just that in a way, I don't think we ever could have replicated it. And in a way, you know, so it's like, I don't know which I'm more sad about because I have this memory of them and I don't know if I would enjoy them as much if I made them, so. Yeah. <laughs> My mom used to make sugar cookies during the holidays and I like making sugar cookies too now. I like cutting them out. So Valentine's is coming up so I'm Gonna make some Valentine cookies. Awesome, <laughs> decorate them too. That's so sweet. That's what great. a beautiful way to carry your mom with you, and that's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, Michelle, I like what you named too because I I feel like that's a um, like if I hadn't learned um, oh, Lefsa like learning that alongside like my grandma and my mom and my aunts like um and my uncles too like they've gotten into it but I feel like we wouldn't know like it's like one little note card that's just like very like basic like and there's so much to making lefsa like that it's not explained on this card so it's like yeah it'd be very difficult if you can't like you know learn and and be kind of doing that in person with with that person who's done it however many years like because because they're like well I don't know I just do it like you know <laughs> and you're like that does that doesn't help <laughs> yeah I hear a timer we're gonna get the magical moment in baking show where <laughs> the food comes out done they come. I think one of the things um so my mom never cooked or baked um and grandma joey oh look at that that looks so good. Would you like us all to text you our addresses? I have yours. I can swing by. <laughs> I'm rather shameless about these scones. <laughs> um, but I was just going to say, like, I think um, my grandma, uh, my grandma Joe was like, not that like soft, you know, if you think of like, if I think of kind of the image of grandma as this like has an apron and was like warm and fuzzy and baked you cookies like that's not my grandma joey she was like she always worked full time she was um very pre like practical and pragmatic and very i mean very loving not soft and not like all of her cooking and everything was very utilitarian um and she usually just did it and she wouldn't let you help but she always let me help um make chocolate chip cookies and like i've realized that like I've always loved cookie dough. And I think one of the things like I've only more recently realized is like, yeah, I love sugar and chocolate, but I think like it's the eating of cookie dough was like safety. It was like, cause that's what my grandma was for me. And I've always loved cookie dough. And I just think about how, whenever I've been stressed in my life, I like want to eat cookie dough, <laughs> you know, and how much of that's actually because my grandma was safe. Mm -hmm. And, and what a gift that's been in my life. And so I think too, one of the things I love is about thinking about baking is that it's, it's, you know, for, you know, a long time now, it's been the generational family thing. And very often historically that's changing more and more now, which I think is great, but it was the domain of women and families. And it was the way of passing down those stories and even like, I love the idea that there's these recipes that weren't fully written down as much as then that makes for loss, mm -hmm. but it, because it's also like, I have my little secret, like, here's my thing in a world where maybe a lot of women weren't able to have a lot of agency in, in the external world, but there were domains and places where they got to have secrets and 
things that were the things that they could tell and share with whom they wanted. And that, um, I don't know, there's something about that that's also like, I think a beautiful thing in a way that um, just like love can be passed on to, um, so. Absolutely. Leah, where do you live? Uh, I live in Hopkins, just, oh, it's just couple. down the street for me. Oh, really? I can be there in seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just a couple blocks off of, of Main Street, so I, I love to be there in five. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be there in 10 minutes. <laughs> that, that is like one of the saddest things for me about COVID is like not having people in my home and like making food because that's like part of what makes like for me like baking or cooking so much fun is sharing it with others too like that's our like you know like we talk about like inviting people to our table but it's like we're sharing like these parts of us like we're like Sarah's just talking about like if share like if if Sarah shows shows up with chocolate chip cookies for me now like I know it wasn't just like you know like Sarah just made chocolate chip cookies it's like that was like a form of like her you know taking a breath of safety and rest and like self-care and then like you share like something delicious out of that like beauty of like taking that for yourself and um so I think that's just like a really <coughs> like and, and that's been like tough for me in ministry too like with our, our volunteer leaders or anything like that, like, or even high school students. And like, that's something in the past where I'm like, they're just like sitting at my table doing homework and then making a big pot of soup or like something like that, you know? So that's just been something I'm very antsy to like be able to get back to. Cause there's, there's something to be said about sharing that um, together too. So hopefully, hopefully we can do this another time and you can all actually, you know, be in my kitchen or or it together to share it also so yeah so now the only thing left to do is is grab your coffee and eat your scone right that's it that's it um yeah are there any other like yeah stories from your own family or baking or kind of thinking about your own spiritual practices and faith and how baking either grounds you or what I don't know what it does for you but um like I know for me, me baking is something that terrifies me because I know you have to like follow the directions <coughs> and that's why actually I've been intentionally like turning towards baking in the last few years from time to time because I think for me that there's actually something important about like going into something that I'm not an expert at and being willing to be vulnerable and being willing to fail and, um, but also to like engage, like, and learn from, uh, you know, a tutor, you know, and say, and so like, that's, um, that's been an actually a place of deep joy for me um, is like discovering like, oh, I can bake something. Like, you know, it's been, has been a, a place of, um, but also of deep surrender, I think for me. So sorry, Michelle, you were gonna say something. Oh, no, no, I, I, go ahead. Are you finished? Well, I just, I mean, so also like the relationship of food and our bodies and like I um, have spent most of my life either <laughs> um, craving or trying to avoid things like baked goods or things that totally, you know, like quote unquote aren't healthy. Um, so I actually haven't even had that many scones because um, I just, try to avoid that. But so one of my questions was, do you, like most baked goods that I make, they taste like so incredible right out of the oven, but there are some things that it's like, no, they're actually better after they cool. And so I'm thinking of most scones that are served or served cold. Um, and I'm thinking of your mom and maybe you're gonna like bring some to her, you know, or whatever, but hopefully not this weekend because it's going to be gross, but um, do you prefer them like right out of the oven or do you um, prefer them when they're already cooled or what? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I like them when they're a little bit warm still. And I think that's just like 
most baked goods, I like the warmness of them when you eat them. Um, but I've had these like the next day and they still taste just as good. And, um, part of that too, is like, we're not like, um, like I don't just leave them sitting out on, on the counter, like putting them in a Ziploc, making sure they're, they're putting something that's going to hold in that, that moisture too. Um, it's good, but yeah, I've, I think these are like enjoyable, you know, later on in the day or, or like, you know, the next day too. Um, I don't know how good they are, but beyond that, I, but I usually don't have leftovers like that. So, um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I think it's a somewhat of a preference, but that's like the thing where, yeah, if you have them at a coffee shop and they're like dry, I'm like, how long ago did you make this? Or, or did you not, you know, make like pay attention to what your dough was like or all that stuff too. So, um, this recipe personally, I feel like I've gotten to a place where they, like the next day they seem really good to me too. There's the hairless cat. <laughs> It's waiting for an appearance. <laughs> That's the second one. <laughs> Andrea or Debbie, were you going to say something? Yeah, I like um, baking and stuff like cook, like oatmeal cookies and uh, sugar cookies. And I like to try this recipe, which she did today. But I don't need all that stuff because I'm a diabetes and stuff. It's hard. Mm -hmm. and I live by myself. and. So I can share them with my neighbors or something, but it, it's hard. Yeah. Thanks for naming that. Yeah. Yeah. I just can drop them off at church. <laughs> <laughs> you could free. I've made scones and, and freeze them. You could, okay. you could freeze them. It's mm -hmm. a good idea. Any other who haven't um, shared who want to share about just your experience of baking and our spirituality and your faith in baking? You don't have to. I just want you to know you can. <laughs> so I have a funny story about learning to bake. Um, my mom always taught us to bake and we bake a lot at Christmas. And she always said that she wanted to make the mess because her, her mom wouldn't let her. Her mom didn't like mess. Um, her mom made wonderful pies. And when I make a pie, a fresh pie crust, I think of my grandma, Betty, but, um, so my mom would, we would always find new recipes and whatever, but I'm a nineties kid and I wanted an easy bake oven as a yeah. kid. It's, it's goes down as the one Christmas present that I really wanted and I never got. And the year that I really thought I was going to get it. I did not open up an easy bake oven, but I opened up a big kit of like miniature baking utensils, like mini bake pans. And there was a whisk and there was spatulas and whatever. And I was disappointed because I wanted an easy bake oven. And my mom, I think she was, she was against the easy bake oven to begin with. Like it doesn't make real mm -hmm. product and it's cheap and you use a light bulb to bake it, like all of that. But she said, I figured I could teach you how to really bake. You can use this and I can teach you how to really bake. And now it's funny because like Phil will bring it up as like, yeah, you never got the easy bake oven. And I, I always say, yeah, but I learned how to bake. I mean, my mom really did teach me how to bake with it and um, taught me so much about just like, I, I would slowly take over all of the things that we did in the kitchen. I mean, when we make Christmas cookies, there's some that she just is like, okay, go make those and she has since I've been like 12 like given me kind of authority mm -hmm. that even my sister can bake but there's stuff that I learned earlier because we were really intentional about it and I like made my sister my little sous chef and <laughs> so then when she was like on her own she didn't realize you had to read the recipe for instance she she made chocolate chip cookies once that looked great and apparently tasted awful because she didn't read the recipe so um yeah, so I didn't get my easy bake oven, but I got something so much sweeter and better. And um, so, that's yeah. awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Marissa. Yeah. Thank you. 
Debbie? Well, I hate to bring this up because that was so sweet and mine's such a downer, but <clears throat> my mother did not bake. My mother cooked because she had to. She was employed full time. She was a minister. So it was sort of like a two-time job. And she was also a minister's wife. So she played out all those duties too. So when I was, I don't know, 10, 11 years old, I found this spread in the teen magazine of the day for an international dinner. And I begged my mother to let me cook this. So I did. I don't remember what was on it other than everything was good, except for the Danish hard rolls. Oh, hard was such an understatement. <clears throat> they could pass for granite. I mean, they were pathetic. So a, I didn't know what I was doing. B, I'm sure the yeast was dead since my mother never used it. Um, but it it taught me that I couldn't bake anything with yeast. And I carried that with me for decades. I mean, I tried that once. It didn't work. So um, I sort of started gingerly branching out. Um, I am proud to say I can bake something with yeast in it. <laughs> Yeah. Not sure it would win a prize, but it's edible. Mm. But I too have some health issues, so eating all this stuff is is difficult to incorporate. Mm. So if I have a way to um, offload it, that's mm. great. But one of the things I've been thinking about, especially recently with COVID, is one of our spiritual gifts is the gift of hospitality. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's one of mine. How, mm -hmm. how do you practice that in the time of COVID? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It has to look different, or maybe it just has to be a season of waiting. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thanks for naming, naming all of that. And I really appreciate, especially that sense of like, there's parts of our stories where sometimes we've had an experience of something and we think, oh, that failed and how that early message stays with us. Mm -hmm. And then the healing that comes when, um, when we turn towards it and, and actually are like, oh, like, yes, I might not go on um, British Bake Off show, but like, <laughs> I can actually work with yeast. <laughs> you know, like, mm -hmm. well, I think too, as a child, there was nothing I couldn't do that I set my mind to. That sounds sort of braggy, but it was true. And since this obviously did not work out, therefore I, I could not do that. That was done. We move on. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. Thanks for sharing all that. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's so true. Like, I mean, and Andrea, you named this too in a time of COVID, like figuring out how to be able to share and mm -hmm. what does hospitality look like? Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's been, I think, a grief for many of us about whether it's hospitality or the gathering around the table or knowing we could actually be gathered for breakfast, you know, a coffee and scones and how many of us have missed even with Sunday. Like I know my spouse's favorite part of Sunday morning worship is coffee after. <laughs> you know, but it's because it's the people and it's the conversation and it's the thing that happens when you gather around food that opens up space that you, you just wouldn't have had. And so I know it's also been a place of grief um, you know, for many of us in different, in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, Leah, thank you so much for um, being with us and sharing about your story and your grandma and your love of baking. And I'm serious, y'all, these scones are legit. Um, so um, I, I just wanted to close then with a, a prayer kind of noticing blessing. Um, I'll put it in the, um, <laughs> who really wants to go outside. Um, I'll put it in the chat there as well. But this is, um, I was just doing a thing looking for something kind of um, related to thinking about baking. And so I'm just gonna highlight a couple parts of this as a, as a way of closing. So I invite you, um, you can read along, you can um, just close your eyes and listen. Um, but here are some invitations thinking about the process of baking. Ingredients. Take some time to look at all of the ingredients in front of us. Right now, in this moment, we have expectations for these ingredients. 
although we don't have a clear way of knowing exactly how our scones will turn out, we can imagine. While we do what we can to not set expectations for this time and mission in our lives, it's almost impossible to not have our own ideas and expectations. And so might we reflect as we see these ingredients of our lives on how our community, our spiritual life might be different than what we expect. So, oh God, might you meet us in these places where the things before us will become a beautiful creation that we might not yet know. For needing, K-N-E-A-D-I-N-G. Sometimes this process can be difficult, taking time and elbow grease, but it's a difficult and sometimes necessary step in order for the bread or the scones to turn out. And so indeed, God, might you meet us in the difficult moments we have experienced this year. Through these challenges we have faced, we have grown. And might you, through the needing of the soul, the soul of our lives, make us into something that might rise and become what it may be for the rising itself. Before the bread can be shared, it needs time to rise. Through rising, bread softens and grows. So, oh God, the times of our lives have acted as leavening. We thank you for the moments, the places, and the people which lift us. May we continue to seek joy and find appreciation for all the people and the places which surround and uplift us. And then for the baking itself. Baking is a process of change. In the case of breads or scones, the sticky dough will convert into a beautiful savory scone. Life is full of invitations for transformation and conversion. When we recognize and accept those invitations, we often leave with growth and change. In what ways have you, have we noticed change or growth in ourselves over this year? Oh God, we give you praise for our own growth and conversion. During this year, each of us has changed in our understanding of justice, love, and compassion. In ways big and small, your hand has guided us towards your heart of love. Might your spirit continue to guide and mold us and transform us. And for the final piece, the sharing. Leah has now finished the scones and we in wish to share it one with another. Our lives are likewise filled with invitations to share even when we cannot gather around tables with coffee and scones. So God, we give you thanks for the opportunity we have to share in this moment, one with another. And we ask that your Holy Spirit will guide us that we might be people who share from the abundance of our lives. May we share compassion, always meeting others where they are in love. For it's in Christ's name that all of life is baked and made into goodness. Amen. Amen. Can you, can you email that to me? Yes. Um, I just put it in the chat and then I can do that too. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And well, thanks for being here. You all. It's great to spend a little time on a Saturday with you. Say hello to Blue for me. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Bye, bye to all of the furry and non-furry friends too. <laughs> nice to meet you.